What up, OMTC Nation? Um, I feel like we are just getting bigger every day and this is so much fun. And we have our own Discord now. We're like cool kids. Um, so thanks for joining. But also that is not what we're here to talk about. We are here to talk about the ridiculous bite-sized camera that is the TXO1. Right around the time that you were probably too distracted by Bruno Mars's Uptown Funk to notice, um, this camera came out. That would have been 2015. And this camera came out at like a, I would say, really bad juncture. It was such a short period of time before cameras got really good in uh, cam cameras got really good in cell phones. And so this thing came and went. Um, it was also really, really expensive when it was released. I think it was like six or seven hundred dollars and within a year they had slashed the price in half, if not more. And now you can get them for, I kid you not, $49 um, on eBay. And I love this camera. So it's a 20 megapixel camera. It's a CMOS sensor, a one inch sensor, and actually the same sensor as the one in the Sony RX100 Mark III. So you open this like this and that's a lens and they actually, the, uh, the guy who invented or designed this called it a floating lens because the lens is quite literally just floating off the surface of the sensor. It is so close in order to get this form factor. Originally when released, you had to attach it to your phone. And when you did that, let me open my phone. When you did that, it would launch the app, which it's doing right now. And now you see the app. Uh, and then you would shoot it like this. And that's great. Like it is wonderful because you get a really good, clear and responsive viewfinder. It works brilliantly. But the thing that I love the most about this camera is that it shoots with the firmware update, which is available in the app store. It shoots in standalone mode. So you can just take it like this and shoot, shoot, shoot. And the funniest part of that experience is the way that you see the world. It is able to show you on the back of the screen what the image looks like roughly, but it looks like a Game Boy. It's just spots in grayscale. And you actually get a decent read on your composition. Now, are you gonna get really refined on like what you're seeing? No, you won't. Um, there is, you know, when, when you are framed up, you know, if you have a pretty clear subject or good contrast, you'll see this. And then when you hit it, I don't know if you can actually see this, but there's a little white box that shows you where your focus point is. And then it takes a picture. I love this because I will absolutely just throw this into anything, my bag, my pocket. Um, and I just always have a 20 megapixel one inch censored camera on me at all times. It's awesome. Okay. Other things. There is a fixed focal length, uh, lens in here. It's a 32 millimeter equivalent lens, 1.8 on the aperture. So it's nice and fast and the dynamic range of the sensor is really, really good. Um, it has auto ISO, or you can manually set it when using the app. When you're using it in standalone mode, one thing to note is it is automatic everything only. So no selecting your ISO, your aperture, your shutter speed, your white balance, etc. At first I thought that was gonna be kind of a deal breaker for me. But because it's pretty recent in terms of technology and the ISO is pretty bananas, it's like very clean, definitely up until 800 and I've used it up to 3200. It gets noisier at 3200 without question, but it's usable particularly when you use it with the DxO 
photo developing software, which I'll circle back to. Um, but overall, it's very good. It reads the exposure very well. It meters well, in other words. It um, has a very cool white balance, which we'll come back to. But overall, these files are so flexible that I don't worry about shooting it in auto mode. And with 20 megapixels, if I'm posting this on social, or even just with some of the like super res and like all the ways that you can upscale images these days, you can crop and not worry about it. So like composing with it is not an issue in standalone mode. All auto in standalone mode, but when you do connect it to your camera, you can shoot it in full manual mode, aperture priority mode, shutter speed priority mode, shutter priority mode, program mode, and you can control everything from the focus to the white balance to, you know, anything you would on a normal camera, which is great. One eight thousandth of a second is the max shutter speed. I have been able to shoot this wide open all day. Not an issue. Uh, it takes micro SD cards for its memory and it is a contrast auto detect or auto focus contrast detect auto focus system. It's super snappy. It's very effective. It reminds me of the spy cameras that my mom had, which I still love the film camera, the Minox. If you've seen that, it's like an old spy camera that took cartridge film and I'm still obsessed with that camera as an art piece. You can actually buy film for that camera at Blue Moon um, and a few other places, but Blue Moon, Blue Moon still develops it. If you don't know, that's a camera shop in Portland. Regardless, my point is, it's such a cool and unsuspecting form factor that that also just makes it really fun to shoot. It's not gonna be the only camera that you want with you to shoot because you're still gonna want to get the itch to like put something to your eye and like frame, you know, all the standard stuff, all the, the tactile feedback that you get from a real camera. But this is bananas to just bring with you all the time. So this is called the Outdoor Shell. And it actually has two casings here. One, which is for like lighter weather, like light rain or something like that. So this still has a touch functionality. I forgot to mention that on the screen, when you have it in standalone mode, you can do just the most basic thing. You can switch essentially from uh, auto and stills, and then you can go to motion. So, you know, not, not, oh, there's, there's motion. Um, not crazy, but it has a touch functionality which is cool. And so this casing here will allow you to maintain that touch uh, feature. For me, I'm like, it does not matter. It's all auto anyway, and I'm not putting this into video mode and I'm not gonna cover the video on this. It does do 1080 and it's supposed to be decent, you know, but there's like gonna be a heavy crop on your video because of the image stabilization that they've built in. So I didn't, uh, it's, I'm not the great video channel, but this for photo is bananas. Um, so I put this outdoor case or shell on it and this is the heavy duty one. So you can see it still has a square cutout, but it's not the same as this. So if you get this set, just know that this is the one that's light weather. This is heavy duty, like underwater. I should have looked up how deep you can go, but you can go underwater with it. And I did use it. What's really cool is with this shell, there's a magnetic function in here to tell the camera to turn on and off. So like the lens is open, but the camera is off, which is not typical. Um, when you do this, the camera turns on. And I just think that's really cool. On here as well is a tripod mount, so you can kind of like stick it on stuff, GoPro mount, whatever. You can do things with it or put it in really fun angles and shoot down. Now I tried to do this on holiday and it just, I didn't have the right rig. I didn't have like a Joby, you know, flexible tripod and whatever, or like weird C stand clamps or whatever. Um, but you can put it in really fun angles. And the craziest part about this is that it has Wi-Fi capability. So you can connect it to your phone and you can frame up and just trigger from your phone and do things that like for me as someone who shoots really old cameras still feels like radically wild. So this camera shoots JPEG, RAW, and what they call super RAW, which is, this is a, a really technical thing and I'm not a super technical person, uh, but super RAW is something where it takes four 
images at once. I mean, you know, like in very fast sequence and it's not HDR. So they're actually four in the exact same exposure value. So four of the same image, but then it's computationally analyzing each of the four to like reduce noise and amplify dynamic range. I do not understand how this works. And I just think it's a banana's testament to the weird technology that existed in 2015 and how it still works so well in 2022. And of course, this was really developed for a, a workflow on the go, right? Like this was intended to be an accessory for an iPhone. So it works really well with the iPhone. When you take an image, it automatically transfers it to your camera, your, you know, your photo folder or whatever, your camera roll. And then if you want, you can just take those images and pop them into Lightroom Mobile and work on the go like that, which I did do. It does not transfer raw images. So that's a bit of a bummer. Uh, I think newer cameras will do the raw. And I know like Ricoh GR uh, does raw transfer, but this only transfers to JPEGs. But I didn't find it too much of a problem. I still worked on a mobile platform. I would tag in my Instagram feed if you go back and want to look. Um, I'll always show, you know, if I edit it in Lightroom mobile, because I think that is helpful to know. All right. So for some negatives now, first is Sony color science. So at first this really threw me. I was an early Sony adopter. I had the first RX 100. I had the first Sony a seven. I always struggled with the greens and the yellows in the color science of this era. They've gotten much better, obviously, like all the new cameras have a completely recal recalibrated color science. But for this early round of color, I didn't love it. That being said, like I'm coming around. So if I really dial in the white balance and my exposure, I'm actually getting some straight out of camera JPEGs that I'm super happy with. One of the downsides is that you can't do a custom white balance. It's only the preset. So you have daylight, cloudy, shade, incandescent, whatever, tungsten. Um, there's no refining of that and there's no Kelvin value that you can dial in on your own, which is a bit of a bummer for me because I would like to just be that much more precise. But I do tend to shoot in raw always. And so I just navigate it that way. But if you're a JPEG shooter, you can get really, really nice straight out of camera images with this setup. The auto white balance does on auto always tend to gravitate towards a cool palette. Too cool for my taste, but some of you might love it. So overall, if you want to talk about color, what I'm finding I always want to do is I'm always consistently wanting to warm up the image overall globally and then specifically warm up and brighten the midtones as well as saturate the midtones. I think skin tones can get really washed out intrinsically as this camera shoots just straight out of camera. So I'm always finding that I'm boosting my saturation a bit. I am boosting my midtones um, and warming everything up. My one month to camera profile, camera profile that I linked down below that you can download. I applied it to these files and it operates a little differently than my CCD sensor images or my JPEG images that I apply that uh, profile to sort of consistently across the board. I definitely need to put more saturation to make these images work the way that I like um, for my, my taste. One thing I have read about or heard about, and I didn't experience it too much myself, is this platform can be a little bit buggy. There were multiple generations. This is the last generation that they produced and it's worked pretty much flawlessly for me, but every once in a while it will get like hung up on processing an image and I'll have to like reset it. There is a reset button on the back. I should have shown you this, but here's where you charge it. And here's the micro SD card. You charge it here and there's like, um, where is it? Yeah, there's like a little reset button right in there if you need to reset it. I never really reset it. I just turned it on and off, but some people have, you know, in forums said they had to reset it, blah, blah, blah. One of the other things that just to watch out for, I, you know, I was worried about the um, sort of architecture of this. So you slip it in like this, the lightning port, and then what's really cool is you can swivel. So you can actually shoot this like a TLR, you know, like you're shooting down while well, I have it connected wrong here, but like this. Um, so you can kind of like, shoot it from down here, which is really cool. Uh, you can't see that like this, uh, but 
On the other hand, like sometimes when I was shooting or just not thinking too fast or too well, I would just take this off and then I would try to close this. You can't close it, so don't force it. You have to realign, which makes total sense when you think about it. It's just like, so you have to realign, straighten everything out, then pull it out, then press this down and then press this back in and it locks. So just be careful. I, I actually think that this is pretty sturdy, but you know, that's the last thing you wanna have break. You will still be able to use it in standalone mode, but it's nice to have some of the manual features. Some other quick negatives is when you are shooting in super raw, the buffer can be really slow. It might just be my card, but um, I was finding I would have to wait like a good second or two for the image to clear. It's shooting those four images, right? So it would take a moment for the image to clear before I could shoot the next one. So I did tend to find myself just shooting straight raw more often than not. The times I would shoot super raw was like if it was really dark or if it was a super high contrast scene. So some of the images that I shot in this lava field that I hiked with my family, it was like sunset, the drama between the black rock and the super bright sky was extreme. Like. I didn't think I was gonna get anything from these files, but they actually recovered really nicely. And I did shoot some of that in super raw, but I actually shot most of it in straight up raw and it worked just perfectly. I edited all of those in Lightroom. Um, but like I said earlier, you can edit these in DxO's software, their photo software. I just love the workflow of Lightroom. I've gone back to it, but DxO software is awesome as well. And it does do a better job of retaining highlights and shadows for the super raw images. I don't know why, I don't know what trickery is happening in the background, but when I was in a really sort of extreme scenario, I would pop it into DxO raw. I would run the sort of, you know, automated changes that it will do as a baseline default. And then I would just export that as a 16 bit TIFF into Lightroom and then tweak from there so that I knew my shadows and my highlights were kind of as good as they were gonna get. Um, that's a bit clunky, but I almost never had to do it and I would never have had to do it It's just when I wanted just that extra chef's kiss Another thing that DxO software is brilliant at on all cameras that it supports is noise reduction So when I took this into a literal Dungeon of a cave I went into the darkest cave I've ever been in it was pitch black and I shot this at ISO 1600 and ISO 3200 at f1.8, uh, manual focus, manual exposure, and it was so much fun. And those images came back a little bit too noisy in many cases, and I ran, I can't remember what it's called. I'll put it here. It's their noise reduction software, and it just freaking recovered like all the detail that was missing and all the uh, noise that existed from shooting in a pitch black cave. Something else to call out, which really <laughs> tripped me up at first is like I said, this is a floating lens and it is seeing a lot in a very small space. So I was shooting it like this. And what I found is this finger was creeping up into the frame. And I was just like getting what I thought at first was like a little flare in the corner. It's not flare. It's literally my finger. It's just so close to the lens that it looks like a little bit like, what is that? So watch your fingers when you're shooting this in standalone mode, or frankly, even in the cell phone mode, like shoot it maybe like this so that you ensure a clear frame. I wouldn't recommend this for macros. It's like macro capabilities start at 20 centimeters or something like that. But again, this is, I think more of just like your everyday point and shoot, just bring it to travel, whatever. Um, you certainly aren't gonna wanna do macro photography with that screen. One of the things also, as someone who shoots mostly really old cameras with really small files, I had to get used to the transfer time of getting these micro SD, um, all the files off my micro SD onto my computer. These are files from 2015, they're raw, they're 20 megapixels, they will take more time to transfer. I mean, it's not a big deal. I would like set it up, transfer it, go grab a drink of water, and then when I came back, it was done. But it's just different if you're an old camera shooter. The biggest issues for this camera, which are just what they are, like there's no getting around it. One is it overheats 
really quickly. Now, granted, I was in Oregon shooting this in the maddest heat wave of all time. It was like on average 105 degrees out. It was insane. Um, but then when I went into that cave, it was 42 degrees, so it was really cold. In 42 degree weather, it performed beautifully. It didn't heat up at all, and I could shoot endlessly, and it was fine. Um, in 105 degree weather, I could shoot it for like five minutes and then it was burning my hand. It just overheated so much. I think in just standard average temperature, you'll be fine, but just, just watch for it. It never shut down or did anything to actually hinder the performance of the thing, but it, it definitely was a tactile overheating that it was experiencing. The other major, and this is probably the most major issue, well actually no, there's two things. Battery life in general is just sh crap. It's just terrible. It's very short. I would go out for like two hours and it would be out of battery. So the workarounds for that is it does charge via this like micro USB. So you can bring a battery pack and have it charging, but that kind of defeats the purpose of the size of the thing. Um, so, you know, use it for casual use or have a backup power supply. It does not charge off of your camera. So the lightning port is not going to be something it draws power from, which is both a good and a bad thing, right? Because it's not gonna drain your camera or your, your cell phone but it also can't pull power from there. So you will need an external battery pack. I would highly recommend one. The biggest issue with this is the proprietary battery that's inside that you cannot replace without physically going into this camera and breaking it apart and taking it out and replacing it and blah, 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 like things that no one's gonna wanna do. If you buy old cameras, you know that these will eventually, any battery is eventually going to lose its capacity to hold charge. So, you know, it may still be 20 years from now, but eventually this is gonna just be, you know, a paperweight, unless you're very handy and you wanna DIY it yourself. But for like 50 to $150 to have something in your bag at all time that is this capable, I am like so down. Like I do not care if this eventually bricks. Um, so anyway, but it is something just to know that, you know, you can't take the battery out. So those are like the biggest pitfalls. Now, a lot of people will say, well, why would I even bother? Why don't I just like shoot on my iPhone? My answer to that is like, I really enjoy having something that is not my phone. I think the phone is brilliant to have. I'm so happy that it's there and I will absolutely use my phone when I need to. Um, but ultimately, I don't want that to be my go-to tool. I am on emails, Slacks, Teams, Google Hangouts, like all day, every day. And so I'm getting notifications all day, every day, and I do not wanna be like, it's just a different mind space for me to use my phone for content versus a standalone device. Not to mention that I think phone photography, as brilliant as it is, especially when it comes to Apple, and I'm sure that's probably true if I used a Google Pixel or something like that, there is just a look to this computational photography, which is, totally amazing and I have nothing against it, but overall I prefer kind of the uh, like more organic vibe your old shit. Like again, sorry, don't know if I can say that, but I don't know. I just think there's a different quality to having a real sensor with real depth of field. I have now picked up two more um, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about it on the channel or in the Discord. But in terms of what I'll be shooting next, I actually have a really exciting camera, totally out of my comfort zone. I will be shooting a K3 from Pentax, from Snappiness. He very kindly sent me his monochrome converted K3 II, I think it is. And it's waiting for me at the, at the post box right now and I am going to try my hand at monochrome converted cameras and go black and white for two weeks. Literally, this is a total first for me and I'm excited to try it. It's again, like I said, very out of my comfort zone, but you know, that's what you gotta do. Like that's what makes photography fun. I am not precious, let's get messy. All right, thanks so much for watching and you can follow me on Instagram at one month two cameras to see shots from the K3 Mark II monochrome converted camera from Snappiness 
And um, yeah, other than that, hit me up on Discord. This is so fun. It's a great conversation and I love being here. So thanks for joining me and I'll see you in the next one. Mm -hmm.